everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Dear listener, what's it going to be? As we come back, this podcast may break your neck. Anyway, calm down because we made it. So, put your hands where my eyes could see. It's time to go flip mode. Flip mode is the greatest. This is the Transatlantic Rebels podcast and it's all about Buster Rhymes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Transatlantic Rebels podcast. Uh, my name is Jessel and my co-host is Rochard. This week, we are going to be talking about a man called Trevor. Trevor George Smith Jr. He was born in Brooklyn, New York on May the 20th, 1972. He, uh, he lived in Long Island, the United Kingdom, and returned back to the States with roots in Jamaica. This guy is one of the true greats of hip hop and He's so underrated by this generation. It's kind of bizarre, but for Rashad and I's generation, I mean, this guy's a hero, absolute hero. His name is Buster Rhymes. Buster Bus. So, Rashad, what are your earliest memories of Buster Rhymes? Well, I guess my my first one was because I wasn't too familiar with the group that he was in called the uh, Leaders of the New School. That wasn't really on my radar. I mean, I knew I had there was a song called um, "This Is the Case of oh, PTA." Yeah, that song right there. But I knew, but I didn't know of him. But my first real experience with Buster Rhymes was, of course, the um, where people who were back then was the uh, c- scenario song from A Tribe Called Quest, and pretty much like everybody did a great job on there. But then I guess when Buster Rhymes came in with his um, with his verse, which which just classes like raw raw like a dungeon dragon, and you little draws because your pants are sagging. It was like very. It was so difficult for you not to get hyped up off of that that verse. It's pretty much like every like I'm pretty sure like people our age like you play that song you go to that part majority of us who are rap fans can probably like go word for word if that song comes on and we can like word that chord I'm not that that verse maybe not everybody else's maybe a little bit of here a little bit of there of like five dog or Q tip but like that's the verse that like put him on the map pretty much that's my first experience with him yeah for me I mean it's it's not that un, uh, dissimilar I didn't really know who new, leaders of the new school were. Um, I was a bit young back then. I mean, for me, really, it wasn't the scenario that came a bit later, but uh, it was, I mean, it was the club life, really. It was, it was um, DJ mixes. It was woo-ha. It was all this kind of stuff. And, and also guest verses as well, you know, like on, on flavor in your ear and rumble in the jungle and all that kind of stuff. But I, I guess it was around 1995 when he really kind of broke. That was his year that he really broke out as a single, uh, like on his own, uh, as a solo artist. And uh, I mean, uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see what the American perspective on Buster Rhymes is. Because in the UK, I mean, like I was saying in the intro, that guy is a hero. He's just an absolute hero. And if you're kind of, I wish we could transport kids back to the 90s to see what it was really like. Um, obviously, everyone's going to have their own perception and, and different viewpoint, but but Buster was everywhere. He was one of the guys, you know. I mean, we didn't really care about Jay Z until about probably like nineteen ninety eight, and that was because of Hard Knock Life. I mean, because of people like Buster Rhymes. I mean, okay, yeah, you had Nas, you had Biggie, you had Park, but Buster was one of those top five, I would argue, in terms of who was on the radio, who was in the clubs, who was just really getting it done you know and and also i mean we'll, i'm sure we'll get into the visuals later but i mean his visuals was just nuts um for me i always kind of like or not always but i kind of had this realization a few years ago where i was like he kind of reminds me of the james brown of hip-hop um because he's just got this incredible energy and, and he just lights this touch paper to whatever he records and he was the go-to guy for so many different you know guest verses posse cuts this that back in the 90s so I mean, I mean, we cannot really underestimate how important he was back then. I mean, I reckon he had a probably about about a ten year period, maybe stretch it to twelve or so, where he was just fire, absolute fire. Um, 
the, the caveat that people always place with him is, oh, he doesn't have a classic album. He doesn't have a classic album. I, I would pretty much agree with that. But the, the funny thing is, in preparing for this podcast, I just don't think it matters. And, and this is me, an album guy, saying that. I mean, I'm in love with albums. It's my thing. But I've got, I've got this playlist of my favorite Buster Rhymes songs. The fucking thing is 80 songs long. I was like, Jesus. I mean, this is, it's just... I love him so much, you know, I really do. And and I remember when I was, um, before we get into it properly, when I was DJing, like, obviously I went from, like, well, I started off on CD, but just for like six months. Then I went to vinyl. Then we went back to CD. Then we went to MP3. Then we went to Serato. And, um, and when I was using CDs, I made this Buster Rhymes compilation disc. And I sort of did the CD printing thing as well. It was all like really lame, whatever. And, uh, and I used to bump it in my car sometimes. Anyone who sat in the car was like, you've got to make me a copy of that. You have to make me a copy. And I ended up making, like, I don't know, probably like 15 copies of just that Buster Rhymes Greatest Hits thing that I had made myself. And, and that kind of spoke so many, I don't know, it just speaks volumes, doesn't it? That people really connected. People my age love Buster, like irrational love. And um, but, but there are reasons for that. So, I mean, what we decided was um, we'd take five songs each and uh, kind of like go to and from and then we can talk, obviously talk about any other things that pop up and stuff like that um like being honest i've actually got 10 songs and i had to cut that the hell down as well but i mean i'm sure we're gonna overlap on, on some of them so we'll just we'll just start getting into it after this break okay so rashad do you want to go first okay i mean i got mine pretty much in like um chronological order so it's not yeah. like just the greatest song or whatever like that. Okay. But um, as like I said, number one has to be for me. I mean, it's not his song, but this is the song, like at least in America, where we came out. It was like, I don't think, I don't know how it was in, uh, in, in, in Europe, but I just know that when Scenario came out and he popped up there, it was like everybody, I was in high school at the time. I think I was even a freshman, maybe. No, I wasn't a freshman. I think I, was a little, yeah, I, think I might have been a freshman. Either I was a freshman or a sophomore. But when that song came out, it was just like, that lyric, I mean, that verse, you can't, it's, I, I cannot, like, express to people who listen to this who never heard of Busta Rhymes, like, how big a deal that, that verse was. It pretty much, like, it was like there was an energy. It was kind of like, it's like around the time Onyx started coming out. I think Onyx maybe came out a year after that. But I think that he was, like, that guy that was, like, that that raw energy. And it was, like, Q-tipping him because it was, like, so, it, it was so contradictory to, like, even with the music of New School. It was, like, those guys were harsh. But he had that energy where it was like every single line of that that verse, like just just shook to your shoulder, chocolate chicken and everything like that. But um, but for me, it's basically like the video, and it's like it captured that that old school hip hop feel of like they're in like these like like the inner city, and it's kind of like the background is like 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 sparse fields, and it's like kind of like manufacturing like facilities in the background, and it's like that that New York coldness where you can like literally see like the the, the the cold breath coming from their mouth and stuff like that and just that 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 old school like browns and blacks and and jeans and jackets and everything like that so it was like just like a moment in time he just came out and just ruled it and I can never forget that one image of him like when he just a row row and it's kind of like he's his mouth is like the size almost the size of like the television screen and it does it like again and again it was just so cartoonish that it was awesome so um that was my first one and I just remember just playing it over and over again. And I could, and I remember watching MTV and just watching whenever they had like the hip hop stuff. You wait for a scenario to come on, and even me and my brother would be hopping around on the couch, going rah rah rah. And <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I guess he was like, because I used to love Onyx back in the day. So I guess like I just started falling in love with that, like that rowdy energy. It was like there was like nobody who had that rowdy energy, and it was just like so fun just to even go. And I think those are two things that associate, actually three things, like ly- like lyrical dexterity. He's, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Just, he's fun, and he just has this, this this manic energy that I don't think many rappers can match, I think, at least in the mainstream. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking energy, uh, he's got to be top five, dead or alive, really. Um, I mean... I've never seen Buster in concert. Uh, I think that's something that I have to probably rectify. If he's in, in in the UK anytime soon, I'd have to go. Um, in terms of scenario, I mean, I, I kind of, like I said before, I kind of missed it because that that was just before my time. Um, 
the the song that I was going to pick first was Wuha, Got You All in Check, because that was really his coming out party as a solo artist. And uh, it, it was included in all these kind of DJ mixtapes, because back in, what, in 95, that's when DJ mixtapes started to filter down to me through my cousins being friends with DJs. So um, I remember this guy called Chirag, I can't remember what his surname was but he, or his DJ name let alone anything else but he used to do these um, these DJ mixtapes I'll, I'll go back to him in, in the next song or so but Wuha was, was one that really kind of exploded on the radio because there was just nothing like it you just <laughs> I mean even now you know trying to sort of put it into context it's really hard because there was literally nothing like that combination of music and lyricism and delivery and I don't know just everything like don't get me wrong I think there are kind of maybe some overlaps between Buster and Old Dirty Bastard I mean oh, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think like ODB was just you know he was part of the Wu-Tang and he was so just like bless him like crazy as fuck whereas I think <laughs> whereas Buster was kind of like Buster didn't seem crazy in terms of like on the scale of lunacy, he seemed like just a manic persona and an incredibly energetic guy. And he could also like spit really complex lyrics as well. Um, he just like, it seemed like this, like a, almost like a puppy with boundless energy, like when he first broke out. And, and the interesting thing is, is that his reputation really started to precede him as well, because that wasn't the first time I'd heard Buster or anything like that. Like say, like I, I referenced before the, the Craig Max song, uh, the bad boy remix of flavor in your ear. So, Back then, it was like whoever had the anchor spot was the one you were really the most hyped about, yeah. And they brought that back kind of probably about like 15 years later. Um, so even though it was Biggie who started it off, like with an incredible verse, it was Buster who closed that song. <laughs> and um, and then same with the the Rumble in the Jungle song, which was the Fugees featuring all these guys. And um, I think Buster finished that song as well. I can't remember. I think that was 95 or 96. And... Um, and and he killed that one as well. So he was that kind of like go he was already that go to guy before he'd even released his first proper solo song. Anyway, so Wuha, I, I don't know, it's just it's difficult to describe it in a podcast. It's like what do you do? You you've got this kind of like the scaling kind of almost like a jazz piano kind of thing. I don't know what the sample is, but and then the the, the drum pattern is just crazy. Like it's so staccato. And his delivery and his singing and uh, just it was brilliant. It was just so catchy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and then and then like when he was you know please don't try to step on my suede shoes and all this kind of stuff. There were just so many quotables and so he's so distinctive. He just completely stood out from the crowd. Don't forget back in ninety five. This was like proper gangsterville, wasn't it? It was like fake ass gangsters or like, you know, these kind of really cinematic things, which you kind of knew were a bit bullshitty, but you, you kind of went along with it, you know, like ready to die. Um, and then you had Puck going off and stuff, but Buster was the outlier for sure. Um, so he really announced himself to the world. Okay. What you got next? I mean, that's my number two. Cause basically oh. I was going to say stuff like, like, yeah. Cause, uh, <laughs> basically like, it's like just the, just the lines that you have, like, for example, like, Yo, which motherfucker stole my flow? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> and you had like the hot, the Harrison Ford references and Star Wars movies like Han Solo, Top Gun, Shot Down Your Firm by Tom Cruise. Like it's like it's like there's so many things. Like when that song comes on, people our age or like, people who were around that time, you know those lines that he comes up with. I will almost say like because I have because I have every Buster album up to two to, to Genesis. So I think it's almost like when I heard the album, I liked the album, but this this song almost. Gave me too much expectation for the album. I thought the album was gonna be like this energy the whole time. And don't get me wrong, the coming is a good album. But I just like I just wanted like 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 ten tracks of like woo ha. But I didn't get that. So it's almost it almost hurt the album a little bit. But it's still a good album. So and that, and that, and that's and that's kind of like a problem. Like like you were talking about before how you were saying like Busta having great albums. I think Busta has good albums. I just think that because you when when Busta have when Busta singles singles come out. They almost hurt his album sometimes because his singles are so damn good that anything doesn't even match the energy of those singles. It kind of like it's like a, a slight come down or even like a big come down in that case. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and, and in terms of the, the last thing I've got to say about Wuha, because we've clearly overlapped, is 
Eminem's first proper single, his label single, My Name Is, kind of reminds me of Wu Hai. It always kind of did. If you think about, like what you were saying, there are so many kind of pop references and stuff. Obviously, My Name Is is, is a lot more explicit in terms of um, lampooning people and himself and whatever. But it's got that, it's got a similar kind of beat, like a really quirky beat, over the top delivery, lots of pop references that people can latch on to as well. Um, so I, I thought that it was a real precursor to, um, to my name, my name is actually, which was only, I mean, it was only like about probably four years before, um, or, or yeah, like three and a half, four years before. So like back then it seemed like a lifetime between those two songs, but, but now it's like a blink in time, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, Okay, so we've already, we've already screwed up and overlapped on one. Uh, so my, my second song was going to be Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See. Please tell me that's not one of your songs. No, it's not. Thank God. Okay, so that was... Um, so I was referencing this DJ called Chirag. Bless you, wherever you are. Um, he, he, used to, he had this mixtape that basically I stole from my cousin. Uh, he made for my cousin. I stole it for about six months and and this is a, one of the things that really got me into wanting to be a dj and the first song on it was um what's it called lord Tariq and peter gunn's uptown baby i don't know if anyone remembers that song oh, i remember that song oh classic and, do, 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 and then wyclef sampled it for hips don't lie but okay whatever so it starts off with that song and then about halfway through the song you, you hear this instrumental coming in i was like what the fuck is this yeah it goes and then and it just comes in and then it fades oh oh my god and and like it was just perfect it was so on point as well so i thought i listened back to it a few years later after i started dj and um and, and that song, Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See, um, there's a really interesting thing that I watched a couple of nights ago by Complex. I think they did it about three years ago where they interviewed Buster and the people who made it and um, that specific song. So they were talking about Buster in general, where he come, came from, leaders of the new school, all that kind of stuff. But it was centered around the, around this song in particular. And for me, this is the one that really took it to the next level for him because this just worked on the dance floor, in the car, on mixtapes, in your headphones. And um, the beat was incredible. And then you saw the video and you're like, oh, my God. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that was the first uh, major video that Hype Williams did. So we always kind of reference, oh, Hype Williams videos, Hype Williams. This is the one that basically kicked it off for him. You had the fisheye. You had this coming to America theme. You had these outlandish visuals. And don't get me wrong, like Missy, I think by this stage, was already doing it because I think the rain came out in 96. Oh, yeah. Yeah, She's already on it. Yeah, yeah. So I've got to give props to Missy. Like Missy and Buster are the two kind of like like yin and a yang of, of this kind of like crazy OTT in your face kind ofness of the of that era of the nineties. But the, but this this song was just absolutely epic. Like everything about it just works perfectly. And if you watch that complex thing on YouTube, um, it's really fascinating because that, like they knew they just knew as soon as they got the beat. I think his his name is um, oh shit uh, sh- um. Schmello or something like that and, and he's the one who made the beat and he sampled it from some random folk record that his parents used to play and then so Buster was saying that they basically had the beat for two days and left it on repeat for two days before he even wrote a thing and like people would come to the studio and they'd hear it shaking from outside the studio and so he didn't lay down a single word for a couple of days and then he just I think he said once he got the first verse down he knew this is going to be like a mega hit basically and uh and then they committed a lot oh the what's the lady's name fuck um she she was like the the head of that part of the label and stuff and she committed a lot of money to the video like back then these guys were spending insane amounts on video um like i don't know that was probably like 400 grand or something that video i don't even want to google how much it was basically oh, you can see it. you can see the money on it but it's interesting if you if you look at it on you find it on youtube but find the video for put your hands with Mark. it's got like only it's only got like five hundred thousand views or something ridiculous mm-hmm. and 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 the love for it is just so immense um oh god do you know what? i could just i could just talk about that song all day to be honest okay um so what's your next one then all right so for me i to me i think this is like 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 as far as buster's popularity i know because like you were talking about how when disaster strikes had uh put your hands with i can see in dangerous and had like that mellow groove because I get I think the improvement the improvement from from the coming to what this when disaster strikes was is is the coming almost had like 
the, the old school like like East Coast beats, but it but it was already getting like passe at that point. And then Buster, when I can see, was one of the trendsetters, so it was kind of like more smooth, more silky beats rather than like that grimy kind of stuff. So I think this is where Buster, like you said, Buster went up on a higher scale because Dangerous and um and Put Your Hands, I can see, it's more like smoother, so everybody can really vibe with it. And then I feel like the next album, if it's a 50 level event, I think that was the one where we talk about with Buster's popularity. I think that might have been, I think it might be two apexes. You can argue about this later, but I think this is like the first apex, like like him, like like all over the place. And to me, that was going by "Give Me Some More," like that video. So my number three was "Give Me Some More." And I just remember when that song came on. And I just remember because I'm I'm a film I'm a film student, and I can remember hearing that that Bernard Herrmann Psycho theme. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then and then it was like he took the fish in like in like that fish eye video it was like just went because because these at least with put put your hand or i can see video it was kind of like the kind of an america it was like relatable you can kind of like feel that like african group vibe but then give me some more just has some crazy ass visuals like this little like small little like blue alien demon thing chasing a girl and he's getting whacked on the head and this is what it, and me and my brother always had a joke about this. This is when he started trying to do flip mode. Like, flip mode's the greatest, flip mode. And then in your mind, like, you're getting hyped, like, okay, oh, shit, flip mode. Oh, my God, oh, my God. But there's a tragedy that happens in flip mode. We can probably talk about it a little bit later. So it was like Buster Rhymes was, like, trying to get flip mode on a scale. He had Rod Digger, Spliff Star, Rampage, all that stuff like that. So you're like, it's like, oh, yeah, I popped my head on the head. And I said flip mode. Flip mode's the greatest. So you're like, you're getting all hyped. You're like, holy shit. Like, like, and like, like, even the name is cool. Like, then they're, they're flip mode, they're going to flip it on you. So you're like, you're thinking like, oh shit, they're coming. Flip mode's coming. But we'll see. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But going back to the song, it's just like, he started like, like he started like just tongue twisting it like crazy. Like that was, that's one of his most technical songs. It's ridiculously insane how technical that song is. Flip what do we do? Give me some more. And the funny thing about it is, it almost doesn't really, in a way, as great as the lyrics are, it almost doesn't matter how great the lyrics are. Like, you're just dazzled by the beat, you're dazzled by the hook, and you're dazzled by his his flow. His flow is so, like, majestic. It's like, it almost doesn't matter what he's saying. Like, you're just appreciating just how he flows. And it flows so damn well with the song. And it's crazy because it's, the, the beat is like... But he's flowing, like, ridiculously crazy. It's like, Jesus Christ. So for me, that's my number three. Yeah, that was one of my songs as well. <laughs> but luckily, I got a backup. Um, but yeah, I'll talk about this just for a minute anyway. I completely agree. This song is just one of his best songs by far, and it also made a massive splash as well. You know, that taking I don't know how much that sample must have cost to get it from Psycho, but it must have cost a fair bit. And they use like they utilize it perfectly. He meshes with the song so well, and that intro. Oh my God, I used to have this friend that literally at least once a week for like five years, yeah, he would just start saying this. He would go, yeah, as a shorty playing in front of the crib, <laughs> fell down, bumped my head. Somebody helped me up and asked me if I bumped my head. I said, yeah. So then they said, <laughs> oh, so that means we're gonna, you're going to switch on him? I said, yeah, yeah, flip mode. Flip mode is the greatest. No one is a shorty. I was told. If I, and he kept saying this part of it, that if I ain't going to be part of the greatest, I'm going to be the greatest person. He just kept saying for five years and it would drive me crazy. <laughs> I was clearly reading that. But uh, it was just it's just genius. And it's kind of like a, this is another precursor to, um, I'm not even going to include it to be honest, so I can tell you, it's a precursor to Break Your Neck. Like Break Your Neck mm. kind of reminds me of this song a lot. But yeah. I mean, Break Your Neck worked incredibly well in a club and I used to DJ the shit out of it. But mm. This is a song is vastly superior because of oh, the yeah. beat and the, and the video and everything. Like it's just, oh, incredible. Um, okay, so my next one was actually going to be on the previous album, um, which was "Turn It Up" remix, "Stroke Fire It Up." I still don't know why it was called that, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, are you going to just call it two songs? I don't know. So weird, Buster. So that was on when disaster strikes. So, so actually, like, that there was put your hands where my eyes could see. Hang on, did that song not chart in the US? What? Which one? Put your hands where my eyes could see. It should have. I don't know why it wouldn't. That song was everywhere. Yo, hang it on. Did, it, it didn't. You... Did not enter the Billboard Hot 100, but it peaked at number 37 on the Hot 100 Airplay chart. What? Holy shit. That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, someone's lying or Jesus Christ. 
So Dangerous from that album did mm. chart at number yeah. nine. And then Turn It Up, Stroke, Fire It Up, uh, peaked at number 10 in the States. Mm. But here in the UK, it went to number two. That was a huge song. Um, so, so okay, th- there's two Slick Rick references because I always have to s- slip Slick Rick into every single podcast with you. And um, the first thing is when you were talking about leaders of the new school, there were some huge Slick Rick references there. I mean, back then, like everyone circa that period was still kind of rapping like Slick Rick anyway, so you can kind of forgive it. Um, this song is, is clearly kind of like a continuation of um, Kit, What's the Story or whatever it's called on, on Great Adventures of Slick Rick, where... Ricky does the same thing basically, except this has the sample and, and it has the kind of like doing the voice properly and stuff like that. So, um, fire it up. Oh, I'm just going to call it fire it up. Um, it, that was such a big song here. I remember, I, I, cause I used to listen to the charts every week and stuff. And I just remember, I think it went in straight at number two or something nuts like that, but it certainly got there. And that sample, um, of Knight Rider and, and, Buster's delivery and everything like that was just amazing. It was a massive song. Everyone loved it. It was really fun. Uh, it worked well in clubs as well. Then you had Punjabi MC. Yeah. <laughs> so Punjabi MC took that song, took Buster's song. Yeah. And then turned it into the Punjabi version. So, so basically the, the beat, yeah, where you're, you're lifting Knight Rider. Um, so there, oh my God. I mean, Jesus, we could do a podcast on that song a lot. So, so that that was like that is still to this day played at every single fucking wedding ever. Like literally, it's what nine? No, I'm not literally not joking. So, 19 years onwards, that song because it was released in '98. They they sort of released it pretty soon after that. There's also I have to mention it. There's a lot of controversy about that song because it it seems to be Punjabi MC didn't allegedly actually have anything to do with that song. It was actually the Cray Twins um, who are the who are these. Uh, these twin brothers who who produced it and later did their own thing with that had songs with Twister and all this kind of stuff. So they kind of hate each other over that song. Apparently it was them that actually did it, but Punjabi MC got all the credit. So whatever. Yeah. So, so yeah, I've got so many memories of that songs. And even back then the DJs used to just completely blatantly mix the two together. So you'd have Buster and then you have Punjabi MC for like a year in every single club ever. So yeah, oh, but, but I love the song itself and, and also the, all the memories it sparks as well. I think it is a great song. I, I love when he's like, right now I'm cruising to the sound of my video CD-ROM. And you're like, what the fuck is a video CD-ROM? <laughs> Jesus Christ, that dates it. So uh, yeah, yeah, just classic memories. Um, okay, what's your next one? All right, I'm probably going to be skipping over a couple of things because I'm just doing my favorite songs, but you might be able to go back to them. You might have a couple of songs that might be in between these ones. But he came out, so that was a sensing level event, that album. And then he had um, um, Anarchy, which is kind of like his. Might it, it might be because I stop I stop after Genesis, so we, we can talk about that a little bit. But for me, I think Anarchy was probably like one of his lowest lowest points as far as like making albums and like singles. I think he had Get Out Get Out, and that was kind of like a like a poor man's version of um, Hard Knock Life. Like, get out! Get oh out, yeah, get out. yeah, yeah. And, and, and Fire was okay, but that was kind of like whatever. And then he came up with the Genesis, and I think like maybe the biggest song off of Genesis was was two and three, like past, actually it was three probably, right? It was it was what it is, uh, Pass the Cavassier Part Two, and um, Break Your Neck. I think those are the, the ones. But for me, my fourth song was on the Big Big Bang, and to me, I think this was like as far as Buster being like popular. For me, I feel like this one was like another peak as far as like his popularity. Like on on to give you some more tip, and to me, that's a touch of remix. To me, oh, I yeah. <laughs> Shit, I forgot about the remix. You, how did you forget about that? How did I forget about that remix? Look, my, my playlist is like 80 songs, man. Like, I, I can't cover, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, okay, go on, go on, sorry. So, okay. So you might have some more insight on this than I am. So so originally it was the original Touch It, the touch it, the touch it version. It kind of sounds like this one. And like it was, it was good. It was okay. It was all right. But then... This video comes out, and all of a sudden, he, he, you see him, he's talking about a, fr- a friend of his, he got murdered, and like, we love you. And then the video comes on, and you hear you hear, you hear him and Spiff start going, Go, bring it low, boss. Bring it low, Spliff. And then you have these these uh, these cheerleaders, these black cheerleader girls come on there. And they go, touch it, bring it, baby, watch it, touch it, bring it, automatic remix. And the thing about the remix, I, I can't, it's hard to explain the remix on here. I, it's hard to explain... Because I feel like the, the Touch It remix is such a damn moment in time. Because not only was the original remix was a hit, I think the original remix had 
the first version of the remix, I think it had um, Mary J. Blige, um, it had uh, Rod Digger, it had Missy Elliott, it had Papoose, and it had DMX. And Lloyd Banks. Lloyd Banks is on that one. And then I think the nine minute version had all of them, and they even had fucking Neo on it. You know, I knew what happened. They added Neo, but what happened on the nine minute version was they usually had, like, each of them usually had, like, two verses. Before you turn, like, the, the, the first verse would be, like, talking low. And then when he says turn it up, they get loud. And I think on the um, the nine minute version, which I got, for a lot of them, I think most of them have, like, like four verses, where it's like, they bring it low and bring it up. And then I think the, the, the most memorable verse on there is Twist is a monster, X is a beast. I'm tired of talking. It's like, you start getting hyped up. Like, turn it up. And, like, and then uh, uh, I'm spazzing all over the point place because it's, it's kind of hard to, like, really <laughs> explain the song because you get hyped thinking about it. It's like a couple of things like uh, like uh, Missy Elliott talking about th- baby hips. You talking about my Beyonce hips? And uh, and Rod Digger talking about he think because we talking to him on the fuck, <laughs> and then you had Mary J. Blige talking about because the breakthrough just came out her one of her biggest albums talking about making thirty three hundred weeks of my sales, and then uh, Papoose with his uh, I got the I got the I got the I got New York in the palm of my hand I smacked yeah. some ridiculous yeah, <laughs> and then Lloyd Banks talking about chinchillas I'm like it's like it's just, it's just, it's just like it's it, I wish you guys need to pause this part of the, like the the the, the um. The um podcast, listen to it and come back. Cause I, I I'd be hard pressed. I think I you could. I think if you would drop the Touch It remix now, I think people would still be hyped if it came out. If you paid it like that, but it was it's just such. It wasn't really about anything. It was more about like just bragging and energy. But the energy and the beat was so infectious. And the funny thing about it was the Swiss Beats beat isn't the most complicated beat, but it's just like that. It's just like the 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 character of the song of like. You talking low and you bringing it up. And the other thing I want to talk about is when they had the BET Awards. <laughs> I'll never forget this one. And he, they had everybody on stage except for DMX. He was maybe in the back. He had like him in the background doing a video clip of like, I'm tired of talking. And then Eminem comes out and he starts rapping to it. And he starts, he, and he's screaming on the first part. And then they say, turn it up. And they're like, and then he, he says another part, and then he says the, the, sec- the third verse. He's like, I'm screaming on the wrong part of the song. I'm tired. <laughs> I was dying. <laughs> you, you gotta watch that clip. There's a clip of I BT. never saw that one. I never yeah, he's like, because 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 on on the stage he goes because because he do the party, do the, the this is Monster X of the Beast, and it goes off and Buster Rhymes does this part, and then all you see is like a shadow in the background on the screen. And he goes, as I could buy, I'm gonna do something to mine. Heal up, what up, but the right the mine. It's shady, and he comes out and he starts doing the thing. Who yeah, who yeah, and then like he does his first verse, and then he does the turn it up, there's another one, and then he comes up, does his low part again. But he's still screaming. He's like, I'm screaming on the wrong bus. And he says, and then he says at the end of it, I didn't know what the fuck the chorus is saying. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? So I was just dying. But that's like just such a moment in time when that remix came out. That was like in every club I would go to. It was just like in, it was bumping yeah. in like every car I almost heard. It was ridiculous. I, I would DJ every single gig that I was doing at that time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you get a response. It's like, it's, and, it's, and we, we, every, when you turn it up, everybody in the club starts turning up. Like, turn it up. Because everybody knows that part's coming up. I was like, the Big Bang, I don't remember too many songs from that one. But I just remember that one, that one was like the Give Me Some More of that album, even though I didn't buy that album. But like, that was the one the single, not even the original Touch It, but I think the remix was the one that's like, just like, like just, I think that literally helped that album sell albums, I think. Yeah, it did definitely. I mean, that was a huge album because it was kind of like a, a proper Dr. Dre helmed album. But I mean, the irony is like the the first kind of like four or five songs of that album were amazing. Then it went completely dodgy, and then it finished strong. So it was kind of like I don't know. I always thought people overrated the album, but I mean that that's a different matter anyway. Um, as for the the only other memory I've got from your Touch It remix is they all had these color coded color coded <laughs> things in the video. So like. Um, like Mary J. Blige was completely in white, and then the whole scheme was white, and then Radiger in pink, Missy in purple, Lloyd Banks in blue, Papoose in green, and then DMX in black, and then <laughs> so it's all like wicked. It's just oh, it's just mm. classic. Damn, I forgot. You know what? This podcast is great. I completely forgot about that <laughs> remix. That's crazy. Okay, um, what the fuck was I going to do? I- <laughs> um. Yeah, so I'm going to jump back to Genesis, that album. Mm. So, uh, so okay, on that, 
Well, I mean, we we skipped over some other ones. So basically, obviously, around the time of uh, Give Me Some More, the, the next song from that was uh, from that album, uh, Extinction Level Event, was What's It Gonna Be featuring Janet Jackson. We've just got to mention that. I mean, that was huge. And the oh, yeah, video it was. was just yeah. epic. I think the, I seem to remember that was the most expensive video and it cost like a million dollars um from memory like it's something insane like that um and then then yeah you're right he kind of went through a little bit of a fallow period which in reality was probably about 18 months um and the break your neck was a huge song and it was brilliant classic still popular in clubs to this day whenever i spin it um and then past the Cavassier part two it was amazing i <laughs> loved that song the video is brilliant i just i just Absolutely, always love that song. But actually, the song from that album, um, which I always connected to the most, was um, As I Come Back. So it was this Neptune's beat. Mm. And um, it's just, it's one of the best beats that the Neptunes have ever done, actually, uh, well, in, in my opinion. And this was in their, like, the hottest period. So back, like, from 2000 to 2002, that was when Neptune's just ruled. Like, I think, I think basically every sort of, fifth song was theirs or something stupid like on the billboards like it was that they were that popular and um this this was kind of like a almost like a promo single like a street single kind of thing uh i don't think it charted properly or anything like that but it's just classic so um yeah i I love buster on it it's brilliant but it's the instrumental that that just absolutely killed and i always remember big ted i think it was big ted and shorty blitz on their on their kiss 100 radio show like the late night radio show they used to use the instrumental when they were talking and stuff or interviewing people and uh, it's like these these crazy Neptune sings like, and then so that's like the chorus, and then in the in the real song like Buster's like yo 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 as I come back, and then but then when the actual verses hit, it's like it goes completely switches, and it, it's just like this really bare bone beat, and then you go, <laughs> so it's almost like two different <laughs> songs just constant. It's just. I love that song. If you've never heard As I Come Back, that is like Neptune's at their peak and Buster's like well on form. So um, it, it's just a classic song to listen to. Uh, okay. All right. I was actually, my next song was going to be Touch It. So that was quite a good segue. What's your next okay. one? All right. So my fifth one and my last one. This is my, this is a personal one for me. I don't think this one is like people familiar with or people necessarily care about, but I just like the way that um, basically um, Buster Rhymes asked Eminem to like do a track with him. And I like the story of it where it was like he did a he did a, like like a sixteen, and he set the beat over to Eminem, and Eminem added like thirty two, and then it went back to to to, to him, and he did like a forty eight, and then it went back to Eminem, and Eminem like a fifty two, and it wound up being that Busta Rhyme had sixty four, and Eminem had sixty two, and they were just they were both just spazzing on it, and it's interesting because the beat is from the jump around beat, and basically it's like because my friend was like, doesn't he ever last? And it's funny because there's another remix of this song with um with Buster Rhymes Everlast on it, but I never heard that one because I didn't really care about Everlast at that point. But I just remember that when I heard the le- the legend of the the thing where it was like almost like a, a year they were going back and forth because Eminem was busy and Buster Rhymes was busy and they started spazzing out. And I think I've never seen Buster Rhymes just straight out spazz because he was talking about he's, he he was because because there's this there's this term in 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 hip hop as may not be popular right now, but back in the day when Eminem was like at his peak. Where it's called being renegated, where basically Eminem and Jay Z were on a track, and depending on who you feel uh, uh, destroyed the other person, most people, a lot of people that I know would say Eminem destroyed uh, Jay Z on that track. So it's basically, like he got renegated. So it's basically like if you're if you're a feature on somebody's song and you and you and your feature is better than the actual the actual person who's the song is about, then I said you're being renegated. So Buster Rhymes basically talked about how when the, when the song is called Calm Down, he was like, I'm not going to get renegated by Eminem on this one. And basically he upheld it. And he was like spazzed out on a whole. He spat And the song is like six minutes long. So he's spazzing out for like three minutes straight. Ridiculous. And then Eminem spazzes out for like almost three minutes. And it's ridiculous. And my friend said it best. He was like, that song was, he said that song was like 10 years too late. He said basically. He was like, if that song came out in like the 90s, or even the early two thousands, that song would have been a hit. But I think because now the 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 because like that calm down beat is more like a boom bap beat, and sound and and like the hip hop sound kind of evolved now to more trappish kind of beats. It kind of didn't chart or anything like that. But for me as a as a fan of Busta Rhymes and Eminem, just hearing them just rap for the sake of rapping, I just love that song. That's just for me. That's a really great 
pick actually um uh, you wouldn't have heard it but i recorded the intro before we started and i actually mentioned that song um my next i've actually got uh, i've got loads more but i'll cut it down to two so um yeah the next one i was going to do is is basically he kind of had he's had quite a kind of rough ride due to various reasons like he's had certain addictions and stuff like that but you can kind of mark off you got the big bang which was released in 2006 and then you've got um, Back on My Bullshit, which was released in 2009. So for me, uh, Back on My Bullshit is my favorite Buster album for sure. And I, I think it's probably his strongest from start to finish. The irony is it doesn't really have the biggest singles on it. So what you were alluding to before about saying like when one or two of his singles just overshadow the whole rest of it. This this is like, he, he really kind of keenly keeps the consistency around the same sort of level. Like every sort of track is like a seven or eight, basically. So it's not like a 10 out of 10 classic, but it's like an eight out of 10 for me. Like almost every single song is nuts on it. And even like the like the bonus tracks, there were the three bonus tracks that were just insane. And um, And one of them, it kind of had a bit of trouble in terms of sampling and stuff. So I think it's still kind of, as it is, a bit unofficial. But, um, I mean, there was a video for the original, but the, the remix and stuff. It's called Don't Touch Me. So I don't know if you ever ever heard it, Don't Touch no. Me. Wow. Okay. So so basically, you've got um, you got Don't Touch Me, brackets, throw the water on them, close brackets. And then, and so the original song's perfectly fine. It was released like in 2008. And, and then he did We Made It with uh, Linkin Park. I don't know if you heard that one. That was pretty big. No. Oh, shit. Okay, fine. That was That was a good song. And then, uh, and then he kind of got into the album and stuff like that, whatever. But there was a remix in um, kind of 2008. And, and I mean, it really is one of the best, I, I think one of the best rap posse cuts of all time by anyone. Like, I think it's top 10, basically. And no one knows about it. Like, obviously, obviously some people know about it, but it, it never got like a proper hype release. So it was, it was the Don't Touch Me remix. So basically, it's um, I'm just going from memory here. So basically, Bust, Buster kicks it off. And it's got this amazing kind of, I think it's like James Brown sample or something like that. And it's kind of like a pretty fast beat, like a 106 BPM kind of beat. And so Buster kicks it off. Then you've got the Flipmo squad. So it's like Split Star and the other guy. And then um, I think it's Reek the Villain. And then, um, and then Game comes in and Game kills it. That's one of his best verses ever, probably. And then... Uh, I think it was uh, Little Wayne comes in, and that is literally my favorite Little Wayne verse ever. Like I, I think that's his best verse ever. And and even if you go on YouTube and and watch this remix, like people like a lot of people think that's that's Wayne's best verse ever. Then Nas comes in, <laughs> and then Big Daddy Kane closes it. So it's just like wow. Li- yeah, wow. And and like every single one of them just smashes it and the beat is incredible it's one of like the best beats you'll hear from buster ever and it's just such a shame something just misfired uh, from memory it was kind of like a sample issue but maybe like the listeners can hit me back on that um but it's just such a shame because then you had to kind of like all these other really solid songs like we made it uh hustler's anthem respect my conglomerate world go round but for, like the, the album just didn't hit properly like it should have done but i think it's my favorite buster album by miles to be honest mm. um so yeah i mean i definitely recommend like the don't touch me remix that is just uh, that's one of the best songs that buster's ever kind of it, not his performance but if you just take it the whole posse cut okay. it's essential it's just essential oh i was uh, that's the one i was listening to today i got stuck on it today um and then just like a couple of other things before i, I get to my last song um which is not actually his song ironically so um yeah i was going to mention we made it with lincoln park that was huge the video was huge as well like in in the europe actually in europe i seem to remember it was gigantic hit in europe um also he did another one with uh dj scribble uh called everybody come on and that was wicked um like dj scribble's traffic jam 97 uh, so that was like a flip mode squad kind of posse cut that's another essential track that people have to cut um his his decade this decade for him has been really quite quiet actually to be honest like in terms of he's done some sort of stuff he did a, like a mixtape with q tip um he's had i think i think he's had one album out and that, that didn't really fire so well there's been odd moments here and there. His defining kind of moment this decade, I would argue, is probably the the Look At Me Now remix. So it's like Chris Brown, Lil Wayne, and then Buster, and then like Buster killed it on that. 
that was like six years ago and he's had a kind of tough time i guess since then um we really need him back because like you know like you're mentioning calm down it was only three years ago you know it's not like Buster can't rap. <laughs> it's well, like, that's not even a question, yeah. Exactly. You know, like he, he's had he's had some like even what was it a couple of years ago he did something else that was nuts and, and all this kind of stuff. Like anyway, so my last question. song. Let me ask you a question before you go on with that. Do you think do you think it's a case of it doesn't make a difference how well he raps is like this generation just moving on to their own type of people? You know what I'm trying to say? Like it's almost it's, it's, it's like sometimes I think in this generation, and it's, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing like when in, in the nineties when my brother my brother wasn't too fond of like the '80s stuff, like the De- Big Daddy Kane stuff. When he, cause my brother came up around like the Biggie stuff, so he wasn't really too, he wasn't really for that other stuff. And I remember, and, I, and sometimes the kids in my, and kids in my school, they talk about sometimes like they're not really feeling the rapidly rap stuff. Sometimes, you know what I'm trying to say? Like they're more like, yeah. I, I mean, I get what you're saying. I just don't. I think Buster's above that because Buster's kind of spanned different generations. Like I always rem- remember what you say, like the sort of. If they made it into the this millennium of MTV, then then the kids will know them nowadays and stuff. And he did, you know. If you're talking about Touch It, Touch It was what 2006, um, and then and then he's had other moments and this and that. It's just he's not put together like a consistent album with two or three big singles basically this decade. So I think that's that's just the big problem. Like it's very hodgepodge right now. Um, and, I mean, you know, he's been in the game a long time. Don't forget, like a hell of a long time. So. We were talking 25 years, like since he was literally on wax. So at some point, there's obviously going to be a slowdown, but he's not that old. I mean, he's only 45. Like he's the same sort of, well, he's younger than Jay, isn't he? I think, no, him and Jay were in school together. Um, and like they battled each other or something like that crazy. I think like, yeah, they're basically the same age. Um, so, I mean, I mean, he could come back easily. He can still rap for fucking miles, you know, like his breath control, like those, Jesus Christ, his lungs, just unbelievable. Um, I think, I think, the bigger issue is things like boring stuff like labels and can he put an album together? Can he get a massive single out? Can it? he was someone who relied on huge visuals as, as well and, and no one's paying money for videos anymore. You know, you think about like that one million dollar video with Janet Jackson, the biggest artists in the world aren't spending a million on, on videos. So it's just, a, it's a very different landscape, but he's still, he can still come back. He's still got a place, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, my last song was probably going to be one of his record- most recognisable ones. And, and it's hilarious because I used to DJ the shit out of this song properly. And, and it really used to piss me off because people would come up to me and say, oh, oh, can you play that Buster Rhymes song? That Buster Rhymes song. I'm like, okay, cool. Which one? Which one? They're like, anti up. I'm like, through gritted teeth. That, that, that <laughs> wasn't fucking Buster Rhymes. That was MOP. <laughs> <laughs> And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. No, no, that Buster Rhymes one. You know, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, that fool. And I'd be like, okay, fine. Thank you. Um, you know what I thought you were going to say? You know what I thought you were going to say? Go on. I thought you, I thought you were going to say, look at me now. No, I mean, I, I referenced look at me now already. <laughs> um, so, I mean, maybe, do you want to grab that one before I go? Oh, to no, 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 no. Just keep going. You're good. Yeah. So, anti up the remix uh, featuring... <laughs> See, even I was going to do it. I was going to say featuring M.O.P. It's a fucking M.O.P. song um, featuring Buster Rhymes and uh, Remy Ma. Yeah, of course, Remy Ma. Sorry, I'm going off memory here. Because in that, she goes, wish I could bring pun back, bitch, run there. And then I actually did a DJ mix where I looped that and then brought in a big pin, big pun song. Uh, I was only like the eight millionth DJ to do that. So, um, yeah, anyway, anti up remix. Buster just came in and um, and smashed that song, dominated it, and uh, and like that was such a huge song. Like it, it cannot be underestimated how big that was. That that was just everywhere, and um, it was sampled and it was in ads on TV and it was in every single DJ mix that I did or, or club situation. It's just the most hype song. And and you're looking at someone like Buster, who's the most hype person in history anyway, and, and him on that beat with MOP, who themselves were like these absolute gangster hype men. It's just ridiculous, you know. Oh, just that song is just incredible. Um I think that's that's going to be one of his defining moments, to be honest, and it's not even his song. So, it, <laughs> you know, like, you know someone's kind of, like, taken over a track when when um, when that's the kind of issue, you know. And that was, like, shit, that was 2001, man. 
Um, crazy, amazing, amazing song. Yeah, that, that's me done. Stick a fork in me. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you want to speak about Look At Me Now? <laughs> I was going to say something like, I know, Brown, I know Chris Brown's Chris your Brown, guy. Chris Brown's he murdered your, you, he murdered you on your own shit. <laughs> <laughs> The I funniest remember, thing is, I, 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 I remember. I remember Chris remember Brown said he said. Chris Brown said, "Oh, I had the best verse in the song." <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I I remember there were so many damn YouTube clips of everybody trying to mimic, trying to do that 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 uh that um. Every time I go to come up, come up, yeah, come exactly. Up. Let me ask you a question: Which which is more impressive, Rap God or Eminem's performance in Rap God or Buster Rhymes' performance? Look at me now. I, I think Buster, because just the song is better anyway. Rap Rap God's a perfectly nice song, but look at me now. No, I'm talking about I'm talking about the I'm talking about the rap performance. I'm not talking about the song. <sighs> I mean, rap, that's kind of unfair because you you got Buster like as a guest spitting for like what probably like twenty four thirty two bars or is triple time, so it's like eight million. And then you got that's what I'm saying. It even <laughs> but, but then you've got like no Rap God's six minutes long or something. <laughs> Of just Eminem, like literally. So it's it's kind of like I don't. All know. right, so let me ask you a question. I get what you're saying. All right, saying. so let's, so let's go there. So let's go there. So who thinks the who's the think is the most, who's the better technician, Eminem or Buster Rhymes? Oh, fuck's sake! Why are you asking me? <laughs> you, let's go. Let's, let's cut. Let's cut right to it. Let's question. cut right to it. Let's go. Um, I'm gonna say Buster. Buster, really? Yeah, because Buster's variety is is like unbelievable. That's the thing. If you if you look at his discography or my eighty song playlist, like it's just so diverse. Like, and, and some people at home might be sitting there and they're thinking you're insane because Eminem's like really like not not just like you know I mean, Buster's one of the greatest, but Eminem's one of the most popular greatest as well and still is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know. I think there's a variety if you look over Buster's career okay. where he. He has gone over pretty much every type of beat ever and all kind of speeds, all genres, all this, all that. And and also, uh, you know what? I'm just going to have to call in like my DJ card here as well because he's given me so many songs that to DJ to, like so many. And Eminem's probably given me like two. <laughs> but see, you see, you're dodging the question. I'm not even talking about songs. I'm talking about skill level. That's what I'm talking about. Forget the songs. It's about just on a technical level. Technical rapping level. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about songs. I'm talking about MC, uh, yeah. But MC. what aspect? No, no, no. What aspects are technical? Because you've got within technical, you've got breath uh, control. You've that's got what I'm talking delivery, about. Delivery. You've yeah, got about, lyricism. Over, you've, got, you've got like a million different things. I'm talking about the overall package of an MC as far as like flow, cadence. Okay, I'm gonna go with Buster. Still Buster. I'm still gonna go with Buster because I think Eminem can be a bit like one note and and then he turned into shouty Eminem <laughs> so whereas whereas, <laughs> whereas Buster started that's off that's only shouty. recent though but that's only no, 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 recent no, no, no. shouty Eminem recent? Is only recent are you kidding me he's been shouting for 10 years Rashad wait a minute he's, he's, he's shouting on the Eminem show you tell me he's shouting on the Eminem show the, M- the Eminem show was 15 years ago we covered this on the 8 Mile podcast that was 15 <laughs> years ago but I'm talking yeah. about over I'm talking about, I'm talking about in general when he started talking- shouting it was around kind of like like when relapse, Wayne, relapse. No, no, yeah, it's relapse and drop the world. When Lil Wayne did drop the, I, can't, I, can't I don't even count drop the world. I don't even care. Fuck that song. No, that was a good that. song. That was a good song. I hate I drop the world. I hate, I hate that song. With, I like with that the, song, and, and I like no love as well. Um, but that's when he really started taking the shouting as like a life's calling, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so whereas Buster started off shouting, okay, and then. Actually, if you watch that complex thing, it was Puffy was taking the piss out of him. Um, it's just saying, all you ever do is shout. Why don't you just try, you know, smoothing it out for the ladies a bit? Like, see if you can, like, mm. lower your tone. So he did that for put your hands where my eyes can see. So they reversed, and, and, it. So they reversed it. Where one person was a yeah. shouty and he turned shouty. And one person was shouty and did stop shouting. Hit you with no delay, so what you seen, yo? Silly with the nah, milly with the dilly, yo. Like that. Before that, if you saw all of his songs, were all kind of like more like woo-ha kind of style or, or like that Slick Rick style. So, you know, after that, he really showed his his versatility. Mm-hmm. And that was only 97, mm-hmm. which was 20 years ago. <laughs> Fuck, we're old. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, if you're talking about technical 
like I, I don't know. Like they obviously don't get me wrong, they're both complete legends. Fine. But I would favour Buster because I, I think also I'm gonna pull the Jamaican card here because Jama- I'm not obviously I'm not black, but Jamaican culture in London especially is just so strong still. Like in the nineties it was just huge and Buster's really obviously a product of that. And okay. like him with Sean Paul whenever they doubled up like on um on the Just Give Me the Light remix or um We Make It Clap remix. You know, those two together were brilliant. And and Buster has down out of the male MCs, he has the best Jamaican accent of any of you American okay. people. <laughs> Basically, like, he, he, he's like, got your faking like uh, like the big three. Oh Jesus Christ! Please, why did you take it there? <laughs> I wanted to end this on a nice note. Why did you make me think of Drake? <laughs> bars, Jamaican bars. No, I'm gonna cry now. Bars. <laughs> blem, blem. <laughs> oh man. Oh damn. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, do you know what? To be perfectly honest, I could, I could do another three hours on this, so it, it's mm. probably better if we just cut it off. Like we've reached around ten. I don't even know how many of the lost count, but yeah, brilliant. So I mean, what what are your closing thoughts on Buster? My closing thoughts on Buster is I think he's probably like in my in my personal top ten, if not top five. If when it comes down, to, like just when if I'm talking about like pure enjoyability. When I want to listen to something to enjoy, because like I'm a I'm a person I'm a rap fan where it's like I just love listening to rappers who love to rap, and and, and like regardless of whether there's a sub, there, there's a meaning or a message or whether there's rapping just to rap, like I'm a fan of people who just like who love the craft of rapping, and you can tell that they've put so much work into their craft that it's just it's like just dazzling to appreciate them, and I think Busta does it every time. I mean, you have to argue with the album stuff, and that's fair, but for me, I'm like I don't know if there's. I, I, I would I would almost argue I don't know if 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 I think Buster might be in the upper ten percentile. To be honest with you, if you're talking about like as far as like MCs, like the straight MCs who are like just like you don't want to get in the ring with them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many people can get in the ring with Buster and hold their own. To be honest with you, I think I think sometimes I think sometimes he just goes easy on people sometimes. But I think it's like it's just a, a pleasure. If that's the word I'm going to use. It's a pleasure to listen to Buster Ron. So that's just the word I want to leave you guys with. Yeah, I, I sorry. I'm actually going to follow you up on something else as well. Um, because you, you mentioned it earlier, something about flip mode. Mm. So you said there was a problem with flip mode or something like that. No, I, I was just saying like how back in the day, like like you would get hyped and think flip mode was going to be like this 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 dynasty, like kind of like the Rock oh. or like or like Dipset. And it never came like, like yeah, Rod Digger who had a couple of hits. And then you had like Rampage and Slip Star. Like you, you, you thought it was going to be like this other clan because in your mind you think it Buster's a, 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 a top tier rapper. So you have to imagine that he's not going to accept anything but the best in a situation. But unfortunately, I guess the stars didn't align or it just didn't work out that way. But Flip Mode never reached the caliber of a Dipset or a, or a Rock Nation or even good music or whatever. Like I mean, you know what? I'm sorry, I stripped that last one for the record. That don't even count. But like some, <laughs> some, something like. So, I was being too generous right there, but something like 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 a dynasty, like the Rock Dynasty, or like a Dipset, or even like e- even um um G Unit, something like that, you know. But it, it, they never took off like that. You're literally naming the only ones that ever had any success. Otherwise, there is a litany of famous MCs trying to bring their people with them, and it going completely wrong. For me, I never once thought Flip Mode Squad would be some sort of gigantic like super group or anything. I don't think anyone did, if I'm honest. I think that uh, because, like, even if you're looking at kind of yeah, G Unit are a complete outlier. Look at Nas with his brother Jungle and the other guys mm. like QB's finest. I mean, Jesus Christ! Um, like, even if you're looking at all the people Jay tried to get through, where are they now? You know, it, this is just just famous this is just how it goes in hip-hop yeah. you've got this elite mc he brings his boys with him one of them probably took a bullet from him, and that's the only reason he's there <coughs> tony yayo <coughs> memphis bleak and then you've got all these other Jesus, kind of people. <laughs> you know like this is just how it goes if anything i actually think flip mode squad work really well together as like uh, whatever song they're on in as general a posse, as a posse yeah i mean the only th- thing that i think is a shame i i never thought they would individually make it except for say radiga yeah. but the the only shame is I think I wish they'd just done an album together. It would have been really fun. Like I think they would have worked really well together. There was there was a really and, and don't forget Buster had already been in a group at, at, like early on, in so school. he knew how to kind of put his ego aside, even if he wanted to dominate tracks. You know, mm. 
I had two more points before we go because we're starting to run out of time. Um, the first point is is he had a greatest hits released. Um, I think it was in like two thousand and two or something like that, or two thousand and one around that kind of time. I was actually listening to it this week. It's kind of like it's it's not the best. It's it's actually a really solid listen and stuff like that, but it's not a great representation of of Buster Rhymes over his whole career. Um, I really hope because if anyone needs a really great greatest hits kind of offering proper compilation a proper compilation is someone like Buster Rhymes yeah. because you know like we were saying before his albums you know like I mean Big Bang was the only number one album of his career I think if from memory and and like you know he always had these two songs that would overshadow everything else and stuff whereas like that compilation I made for me and my more well, for my DJing and then my friends all hijacked it I mean that was amazing and and then he still had other ones other songs since then and stuff like that and if you had you could feel I'm pretty f- sh- confident you could feel like a double disc of oh, his yeah, best easily. work yeah and 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 like people would just be like this is classic like like that's kind of like desert island disc type shit mm-hmm. you would be happy taking that basically um so I really hope that happens I I don't know if it ever will because he's gone through a lot of different labels and stuff um so I don't know um my last point is um basically basically my my wife's like away with work at the moment so I had to put the kids to bed so uh, so basically I've got I've got like a young baby and then I was putting him to bed and I explained to my older to my his older brother I was like listen just stay downstairs whilst I put your little brother to bed yeah and he's like okay fine because he never fucking listens to me he always comes up right as the, as, the, as the baby's about to fall asleep and then wakes him up and I'm like please just please don't do that today anyway so I'm, I'm feeding um, I'm feeding my baby the bottle upstairs, yeah, and then I start hearing this music come <laughs> from downstairs, yeah. and my son had got a hold of my phone, yeah, and um, and was listening to Buster Rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> what song was it? Uh, it? So I think first there was "Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See," and then there was "Fire It Up," <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, I could hear it from upstairs, and I've got my son, my my baby son, falling asleep, and I was like, fuck. What do I do here? All right, just let let the kid listen to Buster. Whatever, mm-hmm. just fuck it. Whatever. He's only three. This is why I was so disconcerted by it. But um, so yeah, there's uh, there's your first. That was your first exposure to Buster Rhymes. <laughs> <Just Ooh-ha! being better. laughs> okay. Do you know what? I really fucking enjoyed that. That was brilliant. That was awesome. So um, yeah, I don't really have any closing thoughts. Just go listen to Buster. Go listen to the, go watch that Touch It remix video. Go check out uh, Don't Touch Me, the remix. And go watch the movie. Watch the after movie. Yeah, and um, the BET Awards when Eminem comes out. That's what I'm going to go watch right now because I've never seen that. (laughs) So thanks, Rashad. And um, don't forget to check out the Twitter handle, which is T underscore Rebels, and the Facebook page, which is Transatlantic Rebels Podcast. Peace. Flip Mole Squad. Greatest.